Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today for this industry spotlight interview. My name is Robin Franco. I am a manager of event operations and services here at ISACA. And today I have the pleasure of spending some time with my uh, favorite lady from Australia, Miss Jo Stewart Rattray. Hi Robin, how are you? I am doing so great and I am so excited that you and I actually get to do this. Um, you've been a part of my ISACA life since I first started almost six years ago. Um, and we're going to get to more ISACA stuff soon, but I kind of want to start at the beginning. Can you share a little bit with me and the audience about your background, where you come from, schooling, and then current state, what is it that you do? Whew, okay, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> I, I was a, a kid from the Australian bush, a literally born in a one horse town. You know, there was a, a post office and general store combined. There was a church, town hall, tennis court, little, little kids school. That was it. Um, and we were about um, 70 miles from the nearest bigger centre. So, yeah, so that's where my life began. Uh, and uh, we moved to South, that was in country Victoria, we moved to South Australia when I was uh, about to start school uh, and um, you know, went to school here in South Australia, um, uh, decided that I was going to be a tech nerd at about age four when I went to a department store with my grandmother and saw somebody using this enormous machine called a contometer, this beautiful looking woman, and I thought, I want to be her. Might have had something to do with her looking so glamorous, but I also wanted to master that behemoth of a machine. So uh, that was when it was predetermined that I was going to be a nerd, I think. You know, I started my career in uh, the music business. So I was working in, in radio. I uh, also worked as a, doing logistics for um, rock and roll tours of Australia. Uh, and there are some pretty funny stories, but they're really the sort of stories that you you have to tell offline um, about losing entire road crews and all sorts of things. But that's that's something for another time, Robin, for you and I, I think, with a cocktail or a mocktail in hand. Um, so it wasn't really until I was probably in my 20s that I actually decided that I wanted to, or no, it, was, it would have been 30, I would have been 30 when I actually, just last week, um, decided that I wanted to do something seriously in tech, not just play around with it on the edges, even though all of that that I had done obviously had a tech flavour to it, you know, because music has a tech flavour to it. Um, certainly the radio business does, recording studios, all oh, there's a tech flavour in all of that. So, uh, but it was when I was sort of about 30-ish, I, I, I made the switch. Um, education, well, I was an adult when I went to university. I was having too much fun before then um, doing some of these wild and crazy things. You know, even my first, my first job, you know, the part-time job you have, a lot of people go babysitting or mowing lawns, that sort of stuff. No, no, mine was actually in a recording studio that also pressed vinyl records. And so my job was to, there's often a little core left in the centre of the hole in the middle of the record. So I used to have to core that out and put it into a sleeve. And at the end of the day, you know, I got paid for it. And at the end of the day, I also got to take home uh, whatever records I wanted. So Christmas presents were not a problem in my house. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, I was an adult when I actually decided to go to university because I'd, I'd been having way too much fun doing all that other stuff. And then I just, I went down a different path at university as well. You know, I decided to do, I was fascinated in, in um, educating people about technology. So I ended up by doing my first, I did a, a, an associate's course to begin with, an associate diploma. Then I went on and did a bachelor's degree. They were both in adult education with, um, with a specialism in lifetime, a lifespan developmental psychology. And then I went on and did my master's degree in educational psychology. Um, and then I started down the Osaka path because I was deep in tech by this stage. I was an infrastructure services manager and so in the utility space. So then I went down this path of doing all the Osaka Core 4 credentials um, and, um, you know, really I guess that's when my real love of, of uh, security began as well. And what am I doing today? I think that was part of that question that, too. Yep, that was my last follow-up. What it, today, oh. what is your current role 
And what do you love most about that role? Okay, now, you know, this is typical me. There's not a simple straight answer for this one, right? I actually run a consulting practice uh, in technology and security, and I like to second myself out to organisations to work on the front line with their staff, particularly when they're going through transformational evolutionary practices within the business. So, you know, I, I was a chief information security officer, and so I've I've um, seconded myself out to CIO roles with um, high end tourism operators, all the way through to now. You know, some say I went to the dark side. I say I went to the light side uh, when I became involved in security. Uh, and so, you know, I also contract myself out as a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer. I actually see that role now as converging. So the role that I'm, I've seconded myself out onto at the moment is with a large um, in-home healthcare organisation. So we do hospital in the home. Uh, it's a national organisation and I'm their Chief Security Officer because there is a recognition that you know, there is that convergence between um, informational cyber security and some of the physical security elements as well. So I have to work very closely with my colleagues in physical security and take that into consideration in the security role. What do I love about it? The fact that we are uh, looking after uh, about 110,000 clients every year giving two and a half million hours of care in their home. Uh, We also run um, remote nursing stations. So one of the most remote nursing stations in the world is a silver chain organisation nursing station out in the Abrolhos Islands, which is three and a half hours by fast boat off the coast of Western Australia. So It's so remote that if they need to, it's a fishing community, rock lobster community. So if they need to um, fly somebody out who might have been injured on a boat, they have to get bring the Royal Flying Doctor Service in, and they the 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 chief nurse out there would have to she and her husband actually go and put the lanterns out on the runway to bring the aircraft in. So that to me is this is real frontline care, and so to be a part of that even from the back room is a very special thing to do. Yeah, that's incredible. I, um, you know, I I appreciate what you do. I have a, my father's actually in the process of getting to the point where he needs that in-home care dealing with Alzheimer's. So, you know, the work that you do and the work that those folks on the front line do is just, it means everything to the families because, you know, you guys, you and the teams that are actually boots on the ground, like you guys make that possible for the rest of us to continue living our lives. Oh, thank you. I think that's so true, though. I have the greatest respect for those men and women on the front line. Um, And, you know, the thing about Silver Chain is that we look after everybody from maybe palliative babies, which is very sad, through to that traditional in-home aged care that you were talking about, and hospital in the home as well. So in South Australia, we're called the Royal District Nursing Service, and we actually have the ability to give um, uh, blood transfusion in home. So that makes life for some people much better if they can have all of that at home. So I take my hat off to those people. And in my role, I realise that security is not um, front of mind necessarily for them. Front of mind for them is looking after and caring for individuals. So I try and make it as easy as possible with whatever we do to secure uh, our patient, our, our clients and our staff. I love that. So again, thank you for what you do. Um, so I did some digging and I actually went back into the way back vault of my mind and my files. And I realized that you and I first met in Munich at Eurocax 2017. Oh, yes. Yes. And yes. If that was, believe it or not, my first international trip ever of my life. And I was so nervous. It was only my second conference with Isaka, and you and I met over a pint. I think you had I think you had a glass of wine and I had a beer. Um, but we met at the She Leads Tech Mixer reception that we held. 
Yes, and clearly we were in the hotel because if we were, had been in a beer garden, I would have been the one with the beer and the schnapps. <laughs> we, were, we were inside the hotel at that point. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's so funny because one of the things that stuck out to me, not only were you just so warm and welcoming to literally everyone you talked to, but the passion that you showed talking about the She Leads Tech program and how, you know, I know that you are so passionate about helping women push the boundaries within tech. You volunteer your time with the Isaka She Leads Tech program. How did you first get involved in that? And, you know, when did that really start to become a passion of yours? I've been passionate about women uh, and equality for almost as long as I can remember. I tell the story that when I was seven years old, uh, my dad and me used to watch old movies together. I'd watch the shoot 'em up bang bang ones with him and he'd watch the chick flicks with me. And I remember seeing a movie about a seven-year-old, uh, when I was a seven-year-old, about um, Audrey Hepburn working at the United Nations. And that really resonated with me. I wanted to make a difference for other people. And in order to, to do that, I thought I, I, that's where I want to be. Now, that's a long way from a one-horse town in country Victoria, I can assure you, or, or indeed in, a, you know, in South Australia. It's a long way to UNHQ and never thought it would happen. So I just kept that dream. But I still had this passion all of my life to help other people. And I certainly wanted to help other women because I could see that we were uh, not being treated equally. There were pay issues. There were me too kind of issues when certainly when I was a young woman, it was it was a real uh, it was just seemed to be part of the course that you had to tread uh, and deal with. And, and it shouldn't be. And here we are all this time later and we're still having those issues. But so all of this became really important to me. If you are doing an equal job, you should be recognised equally. So um, I have been rattling on about this to anybody at, at Isaka Global who would listen to me. And, and uh, um, I, I was... On the International Board of Directors, I had the very great privilege of serving our organisation with seven years on that board. Uh, and I was in a new board term in um, uh, Brussels. The, the board meeting was in Brussels, Belgium. And I um, was listening to all the portfolios being given out to the board members and my name hadn't been mentioned. And I was thinking, gee, won't this be cool? Just a year of being a regular board member and being able to, you know, communicate with chapters, just do, do all those really lovely things rather than having to be really pushing a, a particular portfolio. And then the then Chief Knowledge Officer said, oh, and we have a brand new portfolio that we're going to give to uh, Joe Stewart Ratter. And I went, oh, that's torn it. Here we go. I wonder what it is. It's the Women's Initiative. And that turned out to be She Leads Tech. Now, of course, so... I see myself as the volunteer founder of this because I then had to try and find, dig up people to assist me. Um, I met some great people staff side who uh, uh, there were really at the beginning there were only three of us and we worked together to establish what is now the She Leads Tech program, which is, of course, part of the One in Tech uh, Foundation. It's so interesting to see the evolution just from your story of it being branded the Women's Initiative to what it is today um you know I, and i think that speaks to one the tenacity that you've put into continuing to have that conversation even when it's not comfortable even when people don't always want to listen um, and you've done mm -hmm. that you know on the on the small stage at chapter events at conferences but also on a very large global stage as well um you know you you were a part of the UN's Commission on the Status of Women. Um, you know, I know that you were an ambassador to the Australian government. Uh, and believe it or not, you did speak uh, in the US at Capitol Hill, correct? Yes, that, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, I did. It's that to me, that's so amazing to go from uh, where you started to having these in, being, you know, a face and a voice for other women in the industry of tech, but also just in general, um, you know, it's not just in tech spaces where women are marginalized or the, you know, the pay is not equal. 
um, you know, and I love that that's been a, you know, that's been a natural passion of yours. You've said you've always been inclined to help people. Um, you know, of all of these grand stages that you've spoken on, what did you find was maybe the most rewarding um, and also the most challenging? Oh, definitely that question, uh, the UN experience. Um, again, this is something that I kind of got to say thank you to Asaka for in a kind of weird roundabout way. I was hosting a, a very a She Leads Tech event in uh, at, at Oceania Conference and um, we were in Canberra. I just had a beautiful women's lunch with about 20 people, quite high profile women from both industry and government. And in fact, there was a woman there from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, which is, you know, literally the, the office that looks after the, the, um, the Prime Minister and, and the whole of the ministerial cabinet. So top of government in Australia. And this woman said to me, Joe, I know as this event is winding up, you're going to be running for an aircraft, but I'm going to send you a, a link to an opportunity that you must promise me that you'll throw your hat in the ring for. I'm like, sure, Sandra, not a problem. So, you know, I get on the aircraft, go home. As I stand up to leave the aircraft, and yes, I am one of those people who stand up as soon as the the, um, the ding goes off because I a little bit of energy and I just want to stand up, you know. So I'm standing up and I'm just checking my phone, you know, like you do. And there's a bing, have a look. It's sure enough, it's a text message come through from Sandra with this link. So I do what I tell all of my clients not to do. I clicked on the link, clicked on the link, and I went, oh, I can't do that. Yes, I can. No, I can't. And I actually think I said it out loud because the man in front of me turned around and looked at me. So I must have been saying, I can't do that. Yes, I can have a little conversation. And what it was, it was a link to an opportunity to uh, put a submission in as to why I should be one of only two civil society delegates taken as part of the official Australian government delegation to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Um, so I was a little bit taken aback by that. And so I um, I asked my Osaka staff colleagues, do you think I should do this? Well, of course, their response was, hell yeah, do it, girl. So I'm going, mm. and of course, this is a typical government thing. You can you have to put all of this amazing information as to why they should select you in a page and a half or it was something like that. It was like a page and a half or two pages or something. So I spent that weekend. I had a very short time frame. It was like that was Thursday night and I had to have it in by 11 o'clock um, Sunday morning. So I kept, thank goodness for my staff colleagues at ISACA because they, they were wonderful. I would do something, send it to them. They'd have a look at it, send it back with some critiquing. So we went, we did that backwards and forwards. And so I pressed send and thought that's the end of it. You know, I've, I've, at least I've had a crack. I've tried it. I really wasn't thinking that it was going to be successful at all. And you know, again, I'm presenting at an ISACA event in Melbourne. And the phone in my pocket is just vibrating like fury. And I'm going, what is going on there? Anyway, it's the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet <laughs> Office for Women trying to get hold of me. And so they said, oh, um, Joe, can you tell us when you would like, when you would have time to be interviewed? Just a minute, let me have a look at my diary. <laughs> I'm going to move heaven and, and earth to actually. Yeah, <laughs> I right. can imagine. So I, did, I did. I had the call. I really thought I'd probably mucked it up a bit. But anyway, you know, I thought, well, I've had a crack. Um, weeks went by and I thought that's the end of it. And then I finally got the phone call saying, Joe, do you want to come to New York with us? And I'm like, oh, yes. So I suddenly realised that this dream that I'd have go back to that seven-year-old kid um, was about to come true. And I was just completely blown away by that. I remember talking to one of the communications people at, at ISACA, Jay Schwab, and I actually broke down and cried. And, you know, we don't cry in security, so it was a great shock to me when I was talking to, to Jay saying, oh, my God, this is the dream of a lifetime come true, and I actually broke down and cried. He was wonderful, of course. Um, and so I lived in a bit of a dream for three months because we were under embargo for three months. We could not tell anybody anything about it. And there were two ministerial changes in the meantime. It was a complete, um, a 
a complete sort of, um, I don't know, schmozzle almost, but it wasn't until I actually set foot in New York City and checked into the hotel as part of that delegation that I actually realised it was about to happen, that I was going to have my opportunity to be the conduit from civil society to our amazing diplomatic team in uh, the negotiating room, which very few people get to go into, to negotiate a position on empowerment of rural women and girls uh, through the use of technology. So my sweet spot. So I was the technical advisor to the delegation on those matters. So this to me was a huge conduit for me to what I've continued to do. And in fact, it also gave me my position as um, uh, as a board member on the National Rural Women's Coalition as well. So all of this was working in concert together. And, you know, I got the opportunity to take She Leads Tech to the United Nations. I remember having a discussion about She Leads Tech with the Australian ambassador to the UN. Uh, and it was just the most incredible experience to realise that you worked really, really, really hard for nearly three weeks just to get a position that all 193 member states would agree to on the empowerment of rural women and girls through the use of technology. It's not always achieved. They can get to the end of a session of the commission and them not arrive at, at agreed conclusions because one member state perhaps has, has redlined something. So uh, the fact that we had success even made it, it, it more um, uh, important to me. And so that work has continued for me. I've, I've been back to the UN in 2019. I went back again in, uh, virtually in 2021, and I will present again in uh, two weeks' time uh, virtually. Holy cow, I had no idea. That is incredible. As someone who literally in anticipation of this uh, chat today was like sweating profusely, I can't even imagine standing in front of the UN and presenting this huge piece of, uh, would you call it legislation, I would suppose, or? It's, 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 no, it's not legislation. It's, it's not, it's interesting. It's something, it's, it's consensus because all 193 member states must agree to every single clause in what they call the agreed conclusions, which is the world's roadmap. Then all the ministers from each country have to actually report back every year as to their country position. They make a country statement every year on how they've moved forward in some of these issues. And we talk about thorny issues. You might be talking about the empowerment of rural women and girls, but why? Why do they need to be connected, for instance? Well, you know, there are girls throughout the world, even in this amazing country, that suffer from period poverty, right? They do not, they cannot go to school for that one week a month. Uh, it might be here, and, and I know it's similar in the US, that issue is around the fact that the, the buying of sanitary product is so expensive for, you know, for, for um, lower socioeconomic groups. In some countries, it doesn't exist. So these are some of the issues that women face. So if they are connected, they can still be, their education can still be continuing even through that period of time. Yeah, that's so incredible. Um, and it's it's so fascinating to me as someone who's in the near past joined this organization, um, you know, the doors that ISACA opens, y you know, you have been such a long term advocate of ISACA, a long term member of ISACA. You've received so many awards, the Eugene M. Frank Award for Meritorious Performance. Oh, yeah, there it is. The Paul Williams Award for Strategic Leadership. Uh, and also, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have an award named after you, don't you? That's true. I, uh, that happened in 2018. I was just uh, amazed the Oceania chapter presidents got, got together. Um, and one of them said to me, you know, Joe, we'd really like to do something in your honour. And I said, oh, that's how nice, you know, like you don't have to. Um, and so this all happened in fact, I was on an aircraft on my way back from a She Leads Tech event in India when they were meeting, and I got there a bit late. And when I got there, um, they, it, had been, it was a fait accompli. It had happened. The Joe Stewart Rattray Award had been approved by the uh, chapter president, and so it was uh, awarded for the first time in 2018. And it's to recognise women. Well, it's not just to recognise women. It's to recognise people who are promoting the cause of women and definitely that uh, that 
diversity, uh, equality and inclusion piece in, in the businesses in which they operate. So um, it was, it's, it's been a great honour. And of course, we haven't had a conference uh, for, we didn't have a conference in 2020. Uh, and so I think we're now coming up for our 2022 conference. So I'm hoping that the the because the, there's my award and there's also the Tony Hayes Award who was an international chair of the board of directors and there's there's also a, a, an award named for Tony so I'm hoping we see those two awards come back. That is so cool. I don't know if anyone would ever name an award after me. If so, it would probably not be for anything as fantastic as. <laughs> um, so you know. You are such an incredible person to me. I, you know, I am so lucky to have worked with you. Um, I've also been creeping on you a little bit on your Instagram. So, you know, I would, I don't know if you want to call it a hobby or a side hustle, uh, but can you tell me and the audience a little bit more about Boogie Beads and Voodoo Silk? Oh, you have been stalking. Look at you go. Um, <laughs> You're absolutely right. It's a side hustle. Uh, earrings by Boogie Beads, beads by Boogie Beads. Uh, Boogie Beads and Voodoo Silk grew out of my love of, I wanted, always wanted to do something artistic and I'm terrible at painting. That was a disaster. So, um, in fact, I threw all the old paint, paints and painting materials out just recently. And I suddenly realised that I absolutely loved um, working with beads. So I started to uh, hunt really good beads down. So a lot of the stuff that I use is uh, sustainable, recycled or upcycled. These earrings, for instance, are made from sea glass. Um, so, you know, I use uh, a lot of materials that come out of Africa. So recycled brass from the Cameroon, uh, recycled white metal from Ethiopia, recycled glass from Ghana, uh, recycled paper beads from um Uganda. I saw so those. some really lovely stuff. Yeah, they're cool, they're aren't they? Right? Blue. They were gorgeous. Love so them. that's sort of so I do that sort of stuff. And then I love working with silk as well. So I use so I make scarves and silk squares and sarongs and wraps, uh, all using Australian non-toxic dyes, very vibrant colours. And I use a, a method that's roughly um, based on the Japanese shibori technique of dyeing, tying and dyeing over glass. Now, because I live in the Clear Valley, a premium wine growing district, I dye all of my silk over a wine bottle. You amaze me. You're sitting here talking about all of these, these wonderful career moments that you've had, you know, and I can only imagine that it's hard work dedication i know you and i know tenacity uh you my mm -hmm. friend are one of the most tenacious women i have ever met um but you're also resilient which i think is such yeah. an important quality you know in your opinion what's the most crucial either personality trait or strength that you think someone who's looking to enter the industry today would need to thrive Oh, you absolutely have to be resilient, you know, because you have to have, um, sometimes you have to have a skin as thick as Jesse the elephant, you know, because <laughs> even, even though I try to change up the language in my sphere of influence, because we each have one, regardless of where you sit on the org chart and organisation, you actually have a sphere of influence. And so it's about recognising your sphere of influence and then in that sphere of influence, change the language up. Don't tolerate bad language. Don't. And when I say bad language, I'm not talking about four letter words you know I'm talking about people saying oh manpower you know because all that's doing is entrenching that patriarchal notion so to me we talk about staffing or resourcing uh you know I had an experience where I was in a meeting uh with an external consultant myself a CFO and two senior female uh accountants and uh we were talking about a particularly difficult audit that had to be done. The CFO, male, said, oh, well, Belinda, you won't have to worry about this. You'll be pregnant by the time this all happens. Now, do you think that was a little inappropriate? 
the whole room stopped. Everybody just, there was, you could hear the audible intake of breath. This man had so little EQ, he had no idea. So I called it. And I just said, Steve, that is totally unacceptable, inappropriate uh, line of discussion. He looked at me and I said, her, set, her, her um, pregnancy status has got nothing whatever to do with this discussion. And left it at that. And and the consultant who was on the phone, young man, said, Joe, thank you for saying that. It's like, I, so that's the sort of stuff I call it. You know, bad behaviour needs to be called or inappropriate behaviour needs to be called. You don't do quite as blatant as that sometimes. It's just about correcting somebody when they use language that is, that is uh, um, inequitable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's such an interesting... Uh, way to approach it because you know in that instance you were very bold and you were very confrontational but that doesn't always have to be the case um no. and you know I was very, but rob and i was very polite oh you always are i have no doubt about that <laughs> but so joe for some people who you know maybe wouldn't be comfortable in that situation of calling someone out on that behavior you know, what suggestions do you have for how people can start, you know, changing the industry in in other ways without, you know, if they're more introverted or maybe they just fear, uh, you know, public speaking or speaking up, group work, things like that? You know, I don't think it's the time not to speak up. That's just one thing. I, I do think even if it's, even if you don't, I mean, I I was in a position of seniority, so I was I could do that, and I recognise that not everybody is, and I also recognise what it was like when I was uh, in in more junior roles. But I would go always go and tell somebody about it if there was something that had happened that was inappropriate, inequitable, or just plain rude. I would go and talk to somebody about it. You you just can't allow that sort of stuff to go on. And if you change your own language up, that makes a big difference. You know, just, yeah, I, I think it's about changing your own approach and your own language, not to buy into that sort of stuff either. And that's that's the thing. Don't get yourself into a fight about it because that only lessens your position. But definitely, it, it, so it, it, it's typical, it's diplomacy, right? You, you, you're you walking a bit of a tightrope on all of this stuff, but it's a about only putting up with what you are prepared to put up with uh, and only um, and knowing who you can go to, where are your allies? You know, you need to make allies, in particularly in the workplace, you need allies. And so, you know, sometimes our allies can come from the strangest places to people that we don't expect, um, you know, and I've always said that this whole journey is a story for men and women together. Uh, because the only way I believe we make a real difference in breaking the bias is to um, it, it is to stand shoulder to shoulder with our male allies. It's a story for men and women. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And especially, um, I don't know when this will go to air, but we are recording this the day after International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, couldn't be more timely in that respect. And Joe, you know, you touched on it that, you know, things weren't always, uh, you know, sunshine and rainbows. You remember what it was like for you when you first started in junior roles. Um, you know, what, thinking back on that time, what mistakes do you feel that you made as someone in a more junior role that looking back on it now, uh, you know, you would give advice to someone in that position? Yeah, look, this is this is a really interesting point, Robin. I always had this feeling that being a woman in a in a very male dominated uh, area, in in particularly in cyber, uh, that I needed to be better qualified, better uh, work harder, longer, smarter than my male colleagues. And and unfortunately, to a degree, I think that's still true. Um, women, I, I think one of the things that I would say is is you need to get confidence on your own abilities earlier i know one of the things i didn't do was i would go i would do the classic thing 
and look at a job role and go, oh, I can only do 80% of that. Ugh, I don't think I should go for that. Male colleagues look at it and go, I can do 20, 25%. I'm going to give that a crack, right? So I think it's about building our confidence earlier. Uh, so as, And that's sometimes by having role models or, or mentors or um, I wish I had taken on mentor a mentor earlier than I did. Um, that would have, I think, been much more helpful to me. I've also said to women now, if you want, if you would like someone to be your mentor, all you have to do is ask them. What what are they? What's the worst thing they can do? The worst thing they can do is say no, and I think that's the really important part. Make sure that you ask, and if they say no, move on, and there'll be somebody else that's not meant to be, and somebody else will come into your world that will be able to be uh, help you and be your mentor. So I think that's sort of that's one thing that I wish I had have done earlier. Knowing what I know today, would I go down the career path that I've gone down? The answer is probably not. When I knowing what I know now, I probably would have um, done a degree in international engagement and looked to work um, in in the diplomacy space. Sometimes it's interesting to muse about those things. Love, love, love what I'm doing, but I recognise had I had a broader world vision earlier my life might have been quite different. It, yeah, it's always one of those coulda, woulda, shoulda moments. Um, but also, you know, I think that I'm one of those people, everything kind of happens the way it's meant to happen. Uh, you know, yes. you were meant to give a voice to, you know, those who maybe don't have the position to do so. You know, you're yeah. breaking barriers uh, in tech. You're breaking barriers at ISACA. Um, you know, it's just incredible to see the work that you've accomplished. Um, oh, you know, thank I, you. Yeah, and I mean that, Joe. I love you, and I'm so excited. I know that um, we do get to work together a little bit more coming up outside of this wonderful interview. Um, do you want to share your newest sort of Isaka facing role and what you'll be doing. Yes, I'm really excited about this. I have been sort of again agitating in the background, saying I think that um, my region Oceania is a little bit underdone in many respects. We're a long way from from Chicago, and and I sort of feel we get a little bit forgotten sometimes. But because we're a huge country with a small population, it actually works in our uh, favour because we'd, we'd be a great place to be a um, um, a test ground for lots of stuff, right, for Osaka. So I've been talking about all of this stuff for a long while and then the recognition with uh, our new Chief um, Global Strategy Officer, Chris Dimitriades, who I've known forever, um, he and I had been talking about potential things to to bring Oceania back into the light, for instance. And so uh, to, to grow ISACA's impact in the region. And so I've just been appointed as the Oceania uh, Regional Ambassador. So my role is to work with chapters and chapter presidents as a conduit to global and to work with global as a conduit back to the chapters as to what's required in the region because there are things that happen in this region which will be different from other regions but there'll be things that happen here that need similar to support to elsewhere so all kinds of interesting things you know looking at perhaps uh, strengthening our voice to government um, and uh, having a bigger uh, a bigger view of uh, allowing the region to have a bigger view of who Osaka actually is and what we represent Absolutely. And I'm selfishly, I'm super excited because uh, one of my responsibilities here is actually to work with you on the Oceana event and develop that in the future strategy of how we work with the chapters, how we bring content. Um, so it's a really, really exciting time for me. Uh, and I'm excited that I get to work with you because you have so much knowledge and you bring so much passion to the region. Um, and I know that we are almost out of time. So I do have one more fun question to close this out. So if in 150 years, you know, science fails to save us, the human population is sort of getting wiped out and all that's left is a book of your life. What would the title of your book be? 
Oh my goodness, that's a hard question. Um, I think it would be The Adventures of a Girl from the Bush. I love that. <laughs> I think people well, would be very true. surprised uh, to read that, think they'd pick it up thinking it would be one thing and it would be entirely exactly. another. Exactly, because I still think of, you know, I still live and work in the bush, right? So I, I think of my, I just do think of myself as a girl from the bush. So it, um, yeah, so it would there'd probably be like a subtitle as well, you know, The Adventures of a Girl from the Bush, Journey from One Horse Town to the UN or something, you know, or... Because let's be serious, who would have thought a kid from, from a one-horse town would roll out an amazing program personally in 17 countries, you know, with She Leads Deck and look where it is now, you know, it's absolute dynamite. So, uh, And that's that only goes down to the women and men who are involved in uh, in pushing it out and indeed in, in um, working together to ensure voices are heard. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a testament to show that it doesn't matter where you come from. You know, you can achieve big things. You can achieve your dreams. Um, you know, you just work hard and you, as, keep, you keep making noise. As uh, an Australian Indigenous songwriter says, from little things, big things grow. Absolutely. And Joe, you are one big personality that I am happy to have spent today with. I'm happy that you're part of my professional career and a personal friend. And thank you for joining us today and sharing your life with not only me, but also our audience. So I appreciate thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Robin. It's been an absolute delight. It always is working with you. I love it, love it, love it. Thank you so much. Joe, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you everyone for watching. I am Robin Franco. Thanks, Robin.